right, thanks, Mary. Um, I do know that I'm standing between you and lunch, so let's keep this short, right? Uh, the key to splitting a monolith is a very sharp ax. Okay, that was horrible. Uh, that was my last bad joke of the day, I promise. Um, <clears throat> so like Mary said, uh, I work at a consulting company here in town called Headspring, and a lot of what I do is work with existing legacy systems to break them apart into smaller, more modern systems. Now, I've worked there a very long time, and we didn't call these monoliths when I first started. They were just legacy systems or, or mainframes or things like that. Uh, but now we call them monoliths and microservices, so hey, we've got to get with the times, I guess. And so I wanted to talk about uh, in one, one case study in particular. Um, and this, uh, uh, this application dealt with uh, a company that did life insurance and annuities, uh, which was actually a bit of a depressing domain to work in because basically, like, the company makes money when we die, so it was a, a little bit morbid. Um, but this organization and company have been around for over 100 years. They started in like the mid-1800s or something like that, so they've been around for a very, very long time. And the existing system that they were dealing with was also around for a very long time. It actually started sometime in the mid-70s. So this existing code base was over 40 years old. Um, it probably wore flannel in the 90s. It's a like, solid Gen X system. Um, and uh, this system, though, had got this company to where it was today. Uh, this company was the leader of their, their industry because uh, they had this system for, for decades that none of their, their competitors had. Uh, but this system, like many systems, had started to show its age and could no longer keep up with the business. Uh, the workforce itself that was responsible for maintaining this ex existing system uh, was also aging out of the company. In fact, uh, a lot of the developers we were talking to were reaching a retirement cliff in five to seven years. The developers were actually pensioned, which is like unheard of, right? Nobody here has pensions anymore, but they have been around for so long, they actually had pensions, and once they hit 55, they were out the door going ice fishing or something, and we would never see them ever, ever again. So a huge risk to the company that this existing code base had all this knowledge pent up in these people they were about to just leave. And so the uh, IT organization saw this, said, okay, we have a really big problem on our hands, uh, this big cliff coming up, so why don't we just buy a new system that will replace the existing system? And that, unsurprisingly, uh, failed magnificently because this is a custom system that had been built up over decades, and you can't just take some off-the-shelf product and expect it to replace all of that sort of things that have built up over the years. So after buy didn't work, the company looked around and said, okay, Clearly, uh, we can't buy our way out of this problem. So why don't we do something new? And they looked around and said, well, it seems like a lot of people are talking about microservices, uh, so let's do that thing, um, whatever that means. So they said, clearly, we have a monolith, and let's go to microservices. Um, now, one of the problems I typically see in this kind of uh, approach is it can be difficult just to define what exactly is a monolith. Is it just a system that's really old? Like, it could have children, and the children could have children as well? Um, is it just that it's very large? Um, but I've dealt with a lot of large systems that still serve the business very well. So what differentiates large systems that do well for that organization versus large systems that don't? So I looked at this and said, none of these definitions are that good. Like everyone just says monolith's bad, microservice is good. And for me, a, micro a monolith is really a software system whose design, data model, and, and user interface combine too many multiple competing business domains into one single system uh, and application and data model. And it's that competition that really tells us if that system can no longer be brought forward anymore. If that system has too many different people having too many different concerns inside of it, um, then we're gonna have a, a, a point where we can no longer bring that system forward anymore and the system uh, development basically grinds to a halt. So, we don't want this, right, because that means that the system we're, we're dealing with can no longer grow with the organization. And I hear a lot of, like, instead of doing monoliths, we should just go do microservices. But there's a lot of different things between a big system that doesn't work for the company anymore and these really small systems. And on top of that, when you look at the definitions of microservices, they're not very descriptive. Uh, the microservice book says, a microservice is software that is small and does one thing well which are all highly subjective uh, criteria that anyone can point at anything and say, look, that's a microservice. Why? Well, because it's not a monolith. So I didn't like that. Uh, so I had my own definition, which was a microservice is a service-oriented architecture in which we're angling towards the smallest possible, still autonomous boundaries. 
So microservices aren't applications, they're not components, they're not widgets, they're not modules. They're still services, uh, but we're trying to build towards small boundaries. So in this organization, this life insurance organization, the first thing I wanted to understand is, well, what's wrong with the existing system? I mean, I see it's like old and green screen, that's, but what, what exactly about it is causing you problems that mean you can no longer move forward as a business on top of this technology? And so his main business challenges was, one, I want to modernize the workforce. Our existing processes are completely tied to the interface of this legacy system. If we want to try new things, try new business ideas, we can't because it's all stuck in this existing system. So in a new system, we want to take all the things that were done well with that existing system, um, but hopefully do them better, and try to improve where possible. And his big metric he had was, in the existing legacy system, we only can grow our revenue, grow our business, when we introduce new products as they sell something new in the market. In the existing system, we've proven that we can only release new products once every five years, which is a very, very long time. And his yarn mark for success in the new system would be two releases a year, two new products a year. So that's an order of magnitude set of uh, agility that he wanted to go for from the old system to the new system. Now in my head, as a consultant, I know like technology is not going to solve all of those problems. Like going from five-year releases to six-month releases for products that touches everybody in the organization is going to be a lot more than just like going from uh, green screen to like React. Like that's not going to solve all of your business problems. So the system that we design has to be able to enable those kinds of releases. I also talked to the IT folks to say, what are some of the things that you want to enable in this new world that you have? Um, I heard mainly buzzwords, which is kind of typical, uh, because uh, this organization was mainly used to dealing with the old existing system. And so everything they wanted to do in the new system, they wanted to be able to say, you know, we are a, a modern development shop, which means we're going to be agile, we're going to be DevOpsy, and we're going to be modernized. All the things that uh, I guess a CIO would, would want to say. So this would involve, for us, a four-step strategy, the four Ps. Uh, we're going to start with gaining some perspective in exactly what the system is doing today, build out a plan for what the first new system is going to be and how we're going to approach the overall problem, build out a pilot program for that first system that's going to go live, and finally, after the pilot program is finished, then have a phase migration from one system to the next. It's still a P. It still counts. Four Ps, I promise. So step one is gaining some perspective. This is a step that a lot of organizations I deal with either spend way too much time on, like years and years and years trying to gain perspective and analysis, or others to just like Leroy Jenkins right into it and just like want to start developing, start building stuff. So it's important that we kind of approach it like, I kind of think like how do the modern art masters approached like masterpieces and, and exquisite sculptures. That is, they don't try to design every little component and piece up front. And so what they try to do is have a broad sketch of the overview of what's going on and then provide enough detail in some areas to be able to get started. So we're going to try to understand the what, the who, the why, the when, the how of everyone affected by this existing system. So as part of this, we're going to con conduct quite a few user interviews and personnel interviews of everyone involved in this system. And along the way, we're going to get a lot of history lessons. Like, we'll hear about the story about Marsha in 1987, who approved that claim, but by God, she really should not have approved that claim. And of course, we have to approach this with uh, empathy and respect. Even in the back of our head, we're like, geez, could you let it go? <laughs> like, it's 30 years ago. Um, so as part of this, we'll see that emotions are going to run really high. Um, a lot of times, uh, especially as a consultant, when I'm coming in, I'm coming in usually as like the second or third attempt to try to get off of the existing legacy system. So there's going to be a lot of animosity and hurt feelings and uh, just uh, tension and strife between uh, groups inside IT, between groups inside the business. Um, so I have to approach this uh, with a lot of soft skills. Uh, which are ironically named because they're actually very hard, but we call them soft. And so I have to practice empathy, uh, good listening skills, good comprehension skills uh, with the people I'm interviewing to make sure that I'm uh, both hearing what they're saying, um, gaining trust, and making sure that what I'm building is actually going to support them and make their lives better. So as part of this process, I'm really uh, performing a mapping exercise. 
in which I'm trying to map the people, the processes, information, and technology around this system. Now, mapping people could be somewhat straightforward. Um, you could just go look at the org charts and say this is how everyone's organized in the company. But things I try to look for are who are going to be my potential champions inside the organization? Who are going to be the people that, after I deliver for them, they're going to go and advertise for me inside the company, like, hey, you should work with these folks next. You should, you should get your system and your set of functionality on the docket next because it's done so well for us. I'm looking for those domain experts. Who are the people that can answer the hard questions about what the system should or should not do? And so I'm trying to build out just a, a, a picture of who are all the key people involved in order to be successful. Now, this is never going to be 100% accurate or correct. Before we go live, there's always going to be one group that pops their head up and says, wait a second, what are you trying to do? You can't go live. Um, it's usually legal. Like, that's almost always the case. Like, someone, someone's always pops up from there. Uh, but I'm trying to find all the people who care about what we're trying to build and can either have a hand at success or will be a barrier uh, to it going live. I'm also going to be mapping the processes within the organization. And one great resource for this is value stream mapping. Now, value stream mapping is very popular in the lean community in software, but I'm trying to take the business focus approach, understanding the business processes at play. So I'm looking for things like, how long does it take from when a claim comes in to when it actually gets paid out? What are all the steps that, that happen as part of that process? How long does it wait for, for it to, take, to go to one step to the next? And how many things do they do at once? All those kind of lean concepts uh, come out of this value stream mapping exercise. And as part of this, I'm actually going physically to where people are doing the work, to watch them actually perform these processes. What we don't do is send out a survey and say, tell me what your workflow is. And they get back and they're like, step one, open the application. Step two, approve the invoice. Step three, go home. Like, there's probably more involved than just opening. And so I'll go sit and look at what they're doing to see OK, actually, they've got a whole Excel spreadsheet over here, and they've got Post-it notes all around the cubicle describing the actual process that's going on. I want to capture every single activity that's going on to understand what processes are actually enforced and captured by the system versus what processes are actually around the system and between people. This will include some information mapping exercises as well. So all the data that's captured, uh, that's being read, being written, both inside the system and outside the system. So some organizations, they're able to capture a lot of that information inside their mainframe or database, but also see, like, uh, you've got a lot of paper files and folders around here, and really your workflow is just email and Skype. So trying to capture those sets of uh, information as well gives me the a complete picture of everything that's going on. I also want to understand, uh, outside of just that single legacy system, what are all the other technologies at play here? I guarantee, if you have a system that's older than a decade, a developer at some point has given a connection string to the business. And now Excel is hooked up directly to the production database, and critical core business functionality that no one knows about is on the CIO's desktop where they're running their daily numbers and daily reports. That's absolutely the case. That's why I want to have these interviews across the organization to understand where are these, where are these minefields, these grenades these, that, that I will, uh, I'll inevitably run into, that when I switch off that legacy database, suddenly someone yells and screams that I've turned off their business. <clears throat> For the existing technologies, we'll start to catalog what we see in that system. So it'll be what applications and systems are being used. What functions and operations are possible in those systems? How often are those functions and operations used? When are they being used? I'll do a lot of instrumentation here to understand this, uh, this button they say is so critical is only pushed once a year. So how important actually is that, uh, is that function? For individual screens, I'll look to see when information is being read versus what's being written. And we will literally print out the screens and get a highlighter and say, this is this field, this is that field, this is that field, to understand for any given screen, I have to replace that, what are all the back end pieces that we have to touch? And of course, we have to understand what are the dependencies? How does this one system connect to other systems? And inside that system, how are all the components connected to each other? Now, there are some tools to help us with some of these things, but for a 43-year-old mainframe, no. There aren't any systems to do this, so it's going to be a lot of legwork for me to map out how the different pieces are connected to each other. So with this analysis component done, uh, which I want to limit to 
ideally three months or less. Like if you're taking a year to do this, it's probably a bit too long. Again, we're trying to just gather enough information to build out a plan of how to attack this overall problem. Now, to build out a plan, we of course need to look at what are our possible strategies. Now, what I'm trying to avoid here in these different strategies are things like a holistic buy versus build argument that will replace the entire existing system with some new system over here that almost never works. I want to avoid things like um, uh, trying to tackle too many problems at once. So something like Operation Market Garden or Bridge Too Far that's like, I have to have everything succeed and every little component go live if the whole thing is supposed to be successful. I want to pick something that's small enough to be able to go live uh, but still provide some value to the business. So this could involve rewrites. Now a rewrite could mean entirely new software that the developers write, or it could mean a rewrite that's already been done by someone else. So it could look at the existing system and say, you know what, actually this part over here is just dealing with customer relationships. So instead of building our own CRM, how about when we get to that part of the system, we just use Salesforce. Someone's already done the rewrite and we just have to plug in our components to that other piece. One that I really like is to start at the edges. That is, I draw the dependency graph of systems or components inside the system and say, maybe let's not start in a thing in the middle that everyone's connected to. And if possible, can I start along the outside to minimize the amount of integrations or connections I have to worry about when I'm replacing those individual components? If I look at the overall business process or value chain, we can look at starting at the beginning or end of the overall business process as a means to minify the amount of integration and uh, connections that I have to worry about as I replace individual components. So in this case, I can start with a sales process or at the very end of the process. But ultimately, this comes down to, if I'm going from a single system to smaller systems, I have to actually define the names of those boxes that I'm drawing on the board. So that comes down to defining the boundaries of our different services. Now, one thing that I've found a few times is uh, people assume that the, the boxes they draw initially are the correct ones. But over and over, I've found that the initial boundaries we draw on the whiteboard are going to be wrong. And so we should plan accordingly. Now, the problem is that it, can be, it, it may be easy to do things like refactor code inside a code base, but it's much more difficult to do things like refactor boundaries of services. So as much as possible, I want to reduce the amount of work if my boundaries are wrong to get it from one place to the next. Even that, if that wrong is just the wrong name. If I have the name hard-coded into uh, a thousand different places inside of my service, then that's going to be much more difficult for me to rename it to the uh, correct thing at the end. So our service boundaries could follow the organizational structure. This also is known as Conway's Law. That is, I look at the information and organizational structure of the company and say, let's build systems and services to match what we see in the org chart. But org charts never change, right? <laughs> like, most IT organizations I've been with have gone, uh, undergone a, a major reorg within the last two years. And basically, if I just talk to them in any two years, they've just kind of re done a reorg within two years. Like, it's just a constant thing that happens. <coughs> so, Perhaps the organizational structure isn't what I want to focus on. Maybe I build systems around the organizational structure that I want as opposed to the organizational structure that I have. And this is known as the reverse Conway maneuver. I build systems and services over what the organizational boundaries should be versus what they are today. Um, I've had varied success with this because uh, at this point I'm dealing with like people's career aspirations. And so that's really risky to do. So I try to be a little less uh, ambitious when trying to just say, you don't need a customer service department. What you're like, no. Like, there's, these are people's careers on the line. And so I want to be very careful about um, how I'm drawing uh, this kind of reverse picture. I can also look at the value chain to say, um, for the overall business process over the organization of, of the business, if the organizational structure actually matches the business process over the organization, and that business process hasn't changed fundamentally in 50 years, then that is probably a pretty good place to, uh, to draw my boundaries. Um, if my organizational structure does not match the overall business process, then we can assume that there's going to be some change coming in the future. Now, that's just the organizational structure. What about the data structure? Can I look at the database and say, how about I just draw some boxes around these sets of tables, and that will be my new service? Now, it's never that simple. 
Um, usually the picture of my database schema for these legacy systems uh, is like as big as this wall over here. Um, and I met organizations like they plotted it out. They got some expensive plotter. They, they printed out their entire schema. It was too big, so they started color coding things. And those color coding uh, could be a good place for me to draw my service boundaries. But ultimately, though, we will find that there are going to be some boundary issues between uh, different pieces of data inside my database. But we will have cases where there's like the table that everybody uses, and that table has like three or 400 different fields in it. And so it's this one table that means everything to everyone, and that's gonna be very difficult just to say, I'm gonna lift this one table up and put it over there, and now it's gonna be its own individual service. I could look at business or functional areas to say, well, maybe the organizational structure is a little bit too broad. Let me dig one level deep inside of each part of the organization and see how do they organize themselves internally inside of their own organizational boundaries. And maybe that's a better way that we could look at my service boundaries. Or I could look at value streams. That is the overall business processes that derive and define value for the organization. Um, these are things that kind of capture an entire business flow. These are possible areas as well that I could define my service boundaries. Now the challenge here is that uh, value streams often cross organizational boundaries. So that will mean that I may be building systems that have to be used by multiple parts of the organization. So with all this kind of cataloging definition of service boundaries, we have to de decide at some point, where are we going to start? And what I like to do here is to try to catalog the different services that we've identified, different areas of the system, and then plot them against the risk associated with pulling those different pieces out. And ideally, I could start with something that is very low risk, but at very high value, um, that, never, like, that never happens. There's never a piece of the existing system that is really easy to pull out, but also super high value. And instead, you always find the thing that is most valuable to the organization is also the hardest thing to pull out. So I, there's probably something in the middle there that's high enough value but low enough risk that would be a good first step in the process to be able to pull out. I tried to catalog the different risks associated with uh, moving individual components out. And I tried to scale them or try to score them. From a people perspective, um, how willing is the group that I'm going to be focusing on willing to be able to use some new system? Or are they so like in tune with their function keys on the mainframe that any change whatsoever is going to be highly disruptive and maybe those shouldn't be the first people I start with? Perhaps some, there's some large technology risk as well. I'm trying to look at how many connections does this piece have to the outside world? <coughs> Are there some licensing concerns that we have to worry about? Um, if this mainframe lives on for another year, will that incur another eight or nine figure uh, licensing cost to the organization? Maybe those are the places that, from a money perspective, I can focus on next as well. And finally, looking at project and scope risk. That is, are there places in this existing system that I know are going to change in the future? Is there some very large project looming for the existing system that if I tried to replace that part, I'm now having to do that work twice? So in all of this, there's never going to be a perfect place to start. There's not going to be one thing that just stands out and says, yes, that's absolutely the right place. In fact, oftentimes what I'll do is we'll get a ranking of these different, uh, these different risks and values, and I'll just present, present them to the, to the CEO and CIO, and it'll seem like they're just like throwing a dart at the board and saying, we're going to pick that. Um, I don't care as long as we pick something uh, that makes sense to go forward. Now, there are some places that are bad to start at. Um, in the middle step of a process or a highly contentious area or an a part of the organization that doesn't really use the existing system or maybe it's just like a cross-cutting concern across all the different parts of the application, I want to pick something that's, that's high enough value that has meaning to the organization that's going to prove out our approach. Now, as part of this, we're going to have to uh, worry about transitions. That is going from the old system to the new system. And one of the things I want to have is to make sure that anything I pull out into a service is going to be the single source of truth for this. I think one of these is actually Hebrew for uh, thou shalt unit test, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> but we want to build, uh, as we're building out these new services, they have to be the owner of that information. Um, they have to have their own information model that they are in charge of that isn't leaked out to the outside world. So this is going to mean that we're going to have to do things like migrate data paths from the old system to the new system. And the way this will generally work is that I start with my existing monolith, and hopefully you can actually change the existing system. Uh, we'll write to both locations. Then I modify all the places in the old system that read 
from the old database to read from the new database. Then I modify all the places that write to both places to now just write to the new place. And then finally, I go back and remove all the old information from the old database, and it's all going off the new structure completely. What I'm trying to do, though, is just avoid any kind of bidirectional updates. If I have two sources of truth, this is going to cause a lot of contention. And ultimately, I've seen these kinds of, like, I can edit the thing in both systems uh, ultimately fail. We can do this by disabling functionality in existing systems. So this could be things like, you're now going to be approving invoices in this new system. So just remove that screen in the existing system. Or maybe we can't remove the screen, but we just disable that function so you can't do it in the old system going forward. So this comes to our next P, which is going to be the pilot program, which is trying to come up with uh, a complete running system and application that still performs all the functions of the business, but doesn't necessarily have all the bells and whistles of the existing system. So that is, if you took anything else away from this, it's, it wouldn't be uh, a complete running system. Um, we want to have the minimum pieces available to be able to perform uh, whatever that function is as part of it. So part of this is going to be building out a dedicated team. That is, we want to make sure the people on our project aren't also assigned to other projects competing for time and resources for what we're doing. So we have to put police tape around, even uh, sometimes physically, moving these people into a separate place to make sure that they aren't being pulled off into other projects. We're going to be destroying silos, pulling people from multiple parts of the organization. You probably have a project manager, a PMO, you probably have QA, you probably have an operations or DevOps organization. All these are going to be pulled together into one single team to ensure we're delivering for success. The developer is going to want to uh, customize and make all the bells and whistles for this very new application because this is probably the first chance that they're getting to build new software. So they will want to make it as like, crazy and customizable as possible where we're going to have to try to constrain what we're trying to build here, which could be self-contained systems. These work well. Uh, a self-contained system is a system that is completely wholly owned by one part of the organization and no one else uses it. Uh, this works well for back-end applications. Or it can be more like a, a composite UI, where I have multiple services coming together into one single comprehensive user interface. This is mainly used for customer-facing applications versus those back-end sort of systems. There will be navel-gazing and byte shedding by the developers. This is a very complex problem to solve, and they will want to solve the very uh, simple problem and spend a lot of time on that versus trying to reason about the complexity of the system as a whole. They will want to argue endlessly over what technology to use. Uh, the new hotness was whatever noun.js uh, framework is, is new today versus like the old, you know, like reliable technology that's kind of boring to work with, whatever. But through all this, uh, the team is almost certainly not used to these kinds of new techniques and technologies. And so we'll have to invest in training to make sure that they're able to be able to deliver on this new kind of system that we're building today. We'll have to constrain scope to make sure that the business is not putting too much into this first system. And we'll have to constrain goals as well to make sure that we're not trying to end world hunger with this very first system we're trying to put out the door. What we're trying to get to is a complete solution that is still a complete working application, perhaps just for a few individual workflows and use cases, but is still enough of a complete system that someone can look at it and say, yes, that does validate our overall approach. Now from here on out, becomes uh, into our last section, which is a phase migration. Um, and I, in my head, picture it very similar to something us as Texans know near and dear, which is uh, highway construction, uh, which is like endless here in Texas. And in this highway construction, we're not entirely replacing an existing highway with a new highway to the side. And one day, someone flips the switch and everyone's on the new highway. Instead, we're, we're migrating one component, one set of uh, a mile at a time, uh, with a new system on the side of the old system that is a little bit bump, bumpy and janky to go back and forth, but eventually the new system's in place, but at no point was traffic ever stopped. As we're deciding what is going to be the next service, we still have to perform some of the risk assessment and measurements we did before because the picture could have changed as we pick out that next system. We'll be looking at staging our teams as well. That is, instead of having individual projects for each individual service, instead what I want to do is have a more staged approach that as I'm delivering one part of the system, there's always, the, at the same time, the planning folks are looking ahead and analyzing the next system we should be looking at. So there's this continuous delivery approach 
uh, as we go through and replace the rest of the monolith. And finally, the most important question that the business wants to know is, when is it going to be done? Like, they want to know, like, how much is left? And they can say, we have 13,000 story points left, uh, whatever that means. Um, so I try to have some kind of tangible measure of progress, whether that's users or products or, or maybe it's geography, like we've migrated these states, or maybe it's people in the organization or just screens or tables, something that's more tangible and business focused that says we are nearing the end of this overall project. So some final lessons in uh, performing this. Uh, you probably noticed like I didn't talk at all about technology because I've never seen a project fail uh, or succeed solely because of technology. It's always because of people aspects of it. We need to make sure that what we're building is actually going to be solving the overall business problems in a safe way that gets them off of their existing system. We need to practice compassion of our users, and even the system, over disdain. We don't have negative words to say about the existing system because uh, that system wouldn't exist where it is today unless it was actually successful for the organization. We want to have a product mindset over a project mindset. If this system took 43 years to build, it's going to take hopefully not 43 years to replace, but it's not going to be replaced in a year. And finally, of course, we will have no silver bullets. Kubernetes is not going to just make this problem infinitely easier for us. Uh, we have to actually, uh, it is a very hard problem to solve, and there will be a bumps along the way. So if you want more information about this, uh, two great resources I found. Uh, one is the Phoenix Project, uh, a book that uh, really just uh, invented the DevOps movement. And the other one is that other book, uh, the Value Stream Mapping book. Um, so uh, thank you all very much. I hope you enjoy rest the rest of the conference. And um, thank you. <laughs>